Section 18 the truly melancholy part of the policy of systematically making a nation of gamesters is this, that though all are forced to play, few can understand the game, and fewer still are in a condition to avail themselves of that knowledge. The many must be the dupes of the few who conduct the machine of these speculations. What effect it must have on the country people is visible. The townsmen can calculate from day to day. Not so the inhabitant of the country. When the peasant first brings his corn to market, the magistrate in the towns obliges him to take the assignat at par. When he goes to the shop with his money, he finds it seven per cent the worse for crossing the way. This market he will not readily resort to again. The townspeople will be inflamed, they will force the country people to bring their corn, resistance will begin, and the murders of Paris and Saint-Denis may be renewed through all France. What signifies the empty compliment paid to the country by giving it, perhaps, more than its share in the theory of your representation? Where have you placed the real power over moneyed and landed circulation? Where have you placed the means of raising and falling the value of every man's freehold? Those whose operations can take from, or add ten per cent, to the possessions of every man in France, must be the masters of every man in France. The whole of the power obtained by this revolution will settle in the towns among the burghers and the moneyed directors who lead them. The landed gentlemen, the yeomen, and the peasant have, none of them, habits or inclinations or experience which can lead them to any share in this the sole source of power and influence now left in France. The very nature of a country life, the very nature of landed property, in all the occupations and all the pleasures they afford, render combination and arrangement, the sole way of procuring and exerting influence, in a manner impossible amongst country people. Combine them by all the art you can, and all the industry, they are always dissolving into individuality. Anything in the nature of incorporation is almost impracticable amongst them. Hope, fear, alarm, jealousy, the ephemerous tale that does its business and dies in a day, all these things, which are the reins and spurs by which leaders check or urge the minds of followers, are not easily employed, or hardly at all, amongst scattered people. They assemble, they arm, they act, with the utmost difficulty, and at the greatest charge. Their efforts, if ever they can be commenced, cannot be sustained. They cannot proceed systematically. If the country gentlemen attempt an influence through the mere income of their property, what is it to that of those who have ten times their income to sell, and who can ruin their property by bringing their plunder to meet it at market? If the landed man wishes to mortgage, he falls the value of his land, and raises the value of his signets. He augments the power of his enemy by the very means he must take to contend with him. The country gentleman, therefore, the officer by sea and land, the man of liberal views and habits, attached to no profession, will be as completely excluded from the government of his country as if he were legislatively proscribed. It is obvious that, in the towns, all the things which conspire against the country gentlemen combine in favor of the money manager and director. In towns, combination is natural. The habits of burghers, their occupations, their diversion, their business, their idleness, continually bring them into mutual contact. Their virtues and their vices are sociable, they are always in garrison, and they come embodied and half-disciplined into the hands of those who mean to form them for civil or military action. All these considerations leave no doubt on my mind that if this monster of a constitution can continue, France will be wholly governed by the agitators in corporations, by societies in the towns, formed of directors in assignats, and trustees for the sale of church lands, attorneys, agents, money-jobbers, speculators, and adventurers, composing an ignoble oligarchy founded on the destruction of the crown, the church, the nobility, and the people. Here end all the deceitful dreams and visions of the equality and rights of men. In the Serbonian bog of this base oligarchy, they are all absorbed, sunk, and lost forever. Though human eyes cannot trace them, one would be tempted to think some great offences in France must cry to heaven, 
which has thought fit to punish it with a subjection to a vile and inglorious domination, in which no comfort or compensation is to be found in any, even of those false splendors, which playing about other tyrannies, prevent mankind from feeling themselves dishonored, even whilst they are oppressed. I must confess I am touched with a sorrow mixed with some indignation at the conduct of a few men, once of great rank and still of great character, who, deluded with specious names, have engaged in a business too deep for the line of their understanding to fathom, who have lent their fair reputation and the authority of their high-sounding names to the designs of men with whom they could not be acquainted, and have thereby made their very virtues operate to the ruin of their country so far as to the first cementing principle. The second material of cement for their new republic is the superiority of the city of Paris, and this, I admit, is strongly connected with the other cementing principle of paper circulation and confiscation. It is in this part of the project we must look for the cause of the destruction of all the old bounds of provinces and jurisdictions, ecclesiastical and secular, and the dissolution of all ancient combinations of things, as well as the formation of so many small unconnected republics. The power of the city of Paris is evidently one great spring of all their politics. It is through the power of Paris, now become the center and focus of jobbing, that the leaders of this faction direct, or rather command, the whole legislative and the whole executive government. Everything, therefore, must be done which can confirm the authority of that city over the other republics. Paris is compact. She has an enormous strength, wholly disproportioned to the force of any of the square republics, and this strength is collected and condensed within a narrow compass. Paris has a natural and easy connection of its parts, which will not be affected by any scheme of a geometrical constitution, nor does it much signify whether its proportion of representation be more or less, since it has the whole draft of fishes in its dragnet. The other divisions of the kingdom, being hackled and torn to pieces, and separated from all their habitual means and even principles of union, cannot, for some time at least, confederate against her. Nothing was to be left in all the subordinate members but weakness, disconnection, and confusion. To confirm this part of the plan, the assembly has lately come to a resolution that no two of their republics shall have the same commander-in-chief. To a person who takes a view of the whole, the strength of Paris, thus formed, will appear a system of general weakness. It is boasted that the geometrical policy has been adopted, that all local ideas should be sunk, and that the people should be no longer Gascons, Picards, Bretons, Normans, but Frenchmen with one country, one heart, and one assembly. But instead of being all Frenchmen, the greater likelihood is that the inhabitants of that region will shortly have no country. No man ever was attached by a sense of pride, partiality, or real affection to a description of square measurement. He never will glory in belonging to the checker number 71, or to any other badge ticket. We begin our public affections in our families. No cold relation is a zealous citizen. We pass on to our neighborhoods and our habitual provincial connections. These are inns and resting places. Such divisions of our country as have been formed by habit and not by a sudden jerk of authority were so many little images of the great country in which the heart found something which it could fill. The love to the whole is not extinguished by this subordinate partiality. Perhaps it is a sort of elemental training to those higher and more large regards by which alone men come to be affected as with their own concern in the prosperity of a kingdom so extensive as that of France. In that general territory itself, as in the old name of provinces, the citizens are interested from old prejudices and unreasoned habits, and not on account of the geometric properties of its figure. The power and preeminence of Paris does certainly press down and hold these republics together as long as it lasts, but for the reasons I have already given you, I think it cannot last very long. Passing from the civil creating and the civil cementing principles of this constitution to the National Assembly, which is to appear and act as sovereign, we see a body in its constitution with every possible power and no possible external control. 
we see a body without fundamental laws without established maxims without respected rules of proceeding which nothing can keep firm to any system whatsoever their idea of their powers is always taken at the utmost stretch of legislative competency and their examples for common cases from the exceptions of the most urgent necessity the future is to be in most respects like the present assembly but by the mode of the new elections and the tendency of the new circulations it will be purged of the small degree of internal control existing in a minority chosen originally from various interests and preserving something of their spirit if possible the next assembly must be worse than the present the present by destroying and altering everything will leave to their successors apparently nothing popular to do they will be roused by emulation and example to enterprises the boldest and the most absurd to suppose such an assembly sitting in perfect quietude is ridiculous your all-sufficient legislators in their hurry to do everything at once have forgot one thing that seems essential and which i believe never has been before in the theory or the practice omitted by any projector of a republic they have forgot to constitute a senate or something of that nature and character never before this time was heard of a body politic composed of one legislative and active assembly and its executive officers without such a council without something to which foreign states might connect themselves something to which in the ordinary detail of government the people could look up something which might give a bias and steadiness and preserve something like consistency in the proceedings of state such a body kings generally have as a council a monarchy may exist without it but it seems to be in the very essence of a republican government it holds a sort of middle place between the supreme power exercised by the people or immediately delegated from them and the mere executive of this there are no traces in your constitution and in providing nothing of this kind your solons and numas have as much as in anything else discovered a sovereign incapacity let us now turn our eyes to what they have done towards the formation of an executive power for this they have chosen a degraded king this their first executive officer is to be a machine without any sort of deliberative discretion in any one act of his function at best he is but a channel to convey to the national assembly such matter as may import that body to know if he had been made the exclusive channel the power would not have been without its importance though infinitely perilous to those who would choose to exercise it but public intelligence and statement of facts may pass to the assembly with equal authenticity through any other conveyance as to the means therefore of giving a direction to measures by the statement of an authorized reporter this office of intelligence is as nothing to consider the french scheme of an executive officer in its two natural divisions of civil and political in the first it must be observed that according to the new constitution the higher parts of judicature in either of its lines are not in the king the king of france is not the fountain of justice the judges neither the original nor the appellate are of his nomination he neither proposes the candidates nor has a negative on the choice he is not even the public prosecutor he serves only as a notary to authenticate the choice made of the judges in the several districts by his officers he is to execute their sentence when we look into the true nature of his authority he appears to be nothing more than a chief of bum bailiffs sergeants at mace catchpoles jailers and hangmen it is impossible to place anything called royalty in a more degrading point of view a thousand times better it had been for the dignity of this unhappy prince that he had nothing at all to do with the administration of justice deprived as he is of all that is venerable and all that is consolatory in that function without power of originating any process without a power of suspension mitigation or pardon everything in justice that is vile and odious is thrown upon him it was not for nothing that the assembly has been at such pains to remove the stigma from certain offices when they were resolved to place the person who had lately been their king in a situation but one degree above the executioner and in an office nearly of the same quality it is not in the nature that situated as the king of france now is he can respect himself 
or can be respected by others. View this new executive officer on the side of his political capacity as he acts under the orders of the National Assembly. To execute laws is a royal office. To execute orders is not to be a king. However, a political executive magistracy, though merely such, is a great trust. It is a trust, indeed, that has much depending upon its faithful and diligent performance, both in the person presiding in it and in all its subordinates. Means of performing this duty ought to be given by regulation, and dispositions towards it ought to be infused by the circumstances attendant on the trust. It ought to be environed with dignity, authority, and consideration, and it ought to lead to glory. The office of execution is an office of exertion. It is not from impotence we are to expect the tasks of power. What sort of person is a king to command executory service, who has no means whatsoever to reward it, not in a permanent office, not in a grant of land, no, not in a pension of fifty pounds a year, not in the vainest and most trivial title? In France the king is no more the fountain of honor than he is the fountain of justice. All rewards, all distinctions, are in other hands. Those who serve the king can be actuated by no natural motive but fear, by a fear of everything except their master. His functions of internal coercion are as odious as those which he exercises in the department of justice. If relief is to be given to any municipality, the assembly gives it. If troops are to be sent to reduce them to obedience to the assembly, the king is to execute the order, and upon every occasion he is to be spattered over with the blood of his people. He has no negative, yet his name and authority is used to enforce every harsh decree. Nay, he must concur in the butchery of those who shall attempt to free him from his imprisonment, or show the slightest attachment to his person, or to his ancient authority. Executive magistracy ought to be constituted in such a manner that those who compose it should be disposed to love and to venerate those whom they are bound to obey. A purposed neglect, or, what is worse, a literal but perverse and malignant obedience, must be the ruin of the wisest counsels. In vain will the law attempt to anticipate or to follow such studied neglects and fraudulent attentions. To make them act zealously is not in the competence of law. Kings, even such as are truly kings, may and ought to bear the freedom of subjects that are obnoxious to them. They may, too, without derogating from themselves, bear even the authority of such persons if it promotes their service. Louis the Thirteenth mortally hated the Cardinal de Richelieu, but his support of that minister against his rivals was the source of all the glory of his reign, and the solid foundation of his throne itself. Louis the Fourteenth, when come to the throne, did not love the Cardinal Mazarin, but for his interests he preserved him in power. When old, he detested Louvois, but for years, whilst he faithfully served his greatness, he endured his person. When George the Second took Mr. Pitt, who certainly was not agreeable to him, into his counsels, he did nothing which could humble a wise sovereign. But these ministers, who were chosen by affairs, not by affections, acted in the name of and in trust for kings, and not as their avowed constitutional and ostensible masters. I think it impossible that any king when he has recovered his first terrors, can cordially infuse vivacity and vigor into measures which he knows to be dictated by those who, he must be persuaded, are in the highest degree ill-affected to his person. Will any ministers who serve such a king, or whatever he may be called, with but a decent appearance of respect, cordially obey the orders of those whom but the other day in his name they had committed to the Bastille? Will they obey the orders of those whom, whilst they were exercising despotic justice upon them, they conceived they were treating with lenity, and for whom in a prison they thought they had provided an asylum? If you expect such obedience, amongst your other innovations and regenerations, you ought to make a revolution in nature, and provide a new constitution for the human mind. Otherwise your supreme government cannot harmonize with its executory system. There are cases in which we cannot take up with names and abstractions. You may call a half a dozen leading individuals, whom we have reason to fear and hate, the nation. It makes no other difference than to make us fear and hate them the more. 
if it had been thought justifiable and expedient to make such a revolution by such means and through such persons as you have made yours it would have been more wise to have completed the business of the fifth and sixth of october the new executive officer would then owe his situation to those who are his creators as well as his masters and he might be bound in interest in the society of crime and if in crimes there could be virtues in gratitude to serve those who had promoted him to a place of great lucre and great sensual indulgence and of something more for more he must have received from those who certainly would not have limited an aggrandized creature as they have done a submitting antagonist a king circumstanced as the present if he is totally stupefied by his misfortunes so as to think it not the necessity but the premium and privilege of life to eat and sleep without any regard to glory can never be fit for the office if he feels as men commonly feel he must be sensible that an office so circumstanced is one in which he can obtain no fame or reputation he has no generous interest that can excite him to action at best his conduct will be passive and defensive to inferior people such an office might be matter of honor but to be raised to it and to descend to it are different things and suggest different sentiments does he really name the ministers they will have a sympathy with him are they forced upon him the whole business between them and the nominal king will be mutual counteraction in all other countries the office of ministers of state is of the highest dignity in france it is full of peril and incapable of glory rivals however they will have in their nothingness whilst shallow ambition exists in the world or the desire of a miserable salary is an incentive to short-sighted avarice those competitors of the ministers are enabled by your constitution to attack them in their vital parts whilst they have not the means of repelling their charges in any other than the degrading character of culprits the ministers of state in france are the only persons in that country who are incapable of a share in the national councils what ministers what councils what a nation but they are responsible it is a poor service that is to be had from responsibility the elevation of mind to be derived from fear will never make a nation glorious responsibility prevents crimes it makes all attempts against the laws dangerous but for a principle of active and zealous service none but idiots could think of it is the conduct of a war to be trusted to a man who may abhor its principle who in every step he may take to render it successful, confirms the power of those by whom he is oppressed? Will foreign states seriously treat with him who has no prerogative of peace or war? No, not so much as in a single vote by himself or his ministers, or by any one whom he can possibly influence? A state of contempt is not a state for a prince. Better get rid of him at once." i know it will be said that these humors in the court and executive government will continue only through this generation and that the king has been brought to declare the dauphin shall be educated in a conformity to his situation if he is made to conform to his situation he will have no education at all his training must be worse even than that of an arbitrary monarch if he reads whether he reads or not some good or evil genius will tell him his ancestors were kings thenceforward his object must be to assert himself and to avenge his parents this you will say is not his duty that may be but it is nature and whilst you pique nature against you you do unwisely to trust to duty in this feudal scheme of polity the state nurses in its bosom for the present a source of weakness perplexity counteraction inefficiency and decay and it prepares the means of its final ruin in short i see nothing in the executive force i cannot call it authority that has even an appearance of vigor or that has the smallest degree of just correspondence or symmetry or amicable relation with the supreme power either as it now exists or as it is planned for the future government you have settled by an economy as perverted as the policy two establishments of government footnote in reality three to reckon the provincial republican establishments and a footnote one real one fictitious both maintained at a vast expense but the fictitious at i think the greatest 
Such a machine as the latter is not worth the grease of its wheels. The expense is exorbitant, and neither the show nor the use deserve the tenth part of the charge. Oh, but I don't do justice to the talents of the legislators. I don't allow, as I ought to do, for necessity. Their scheme of executive force was not their choice. This pageant must be kept. The people would not consent to part with it. Right, I understand you. You do, in spite of your grand theories, to which you would have heaven and earth to bend, you do know how to conform yourself to the nature and circumstances of things. But when you were obliged to conform thus far to circumstances, you ought to have carried your submission farther, and to have made what you were obliged to take, a proper instrument and useful to its end. That was in your power. For instance, among many others, it was in your power to leave to your king the right of peace and war. What? To leave to the executive magistrate the most dangerous of all prerogatives? I know none more dangerous, nor any one more necessary to be so trusted. I do not say that this prerogative ought to be trusted to your king, unless he enjoyed other auxiliary trusts along with it, which he does not now hold. But if he did possess them, hazardous as they are, undoubtedly, advantages would arise from such a constitution, more than compensating the risk. There is no other way of keeping the several potentates of Europe from intriguing distinctly and personally with the members of your assembly, from intermeddling in all your concerns, and fomenting in the heart of your country the most pernicious of all factions, factions in the interest and under the direction of foreign powers. From that worst of evils, thank God, we are still free. Your skill, if you had any, would be well employed to find out indirect correctives and controls upon this perilous trust. If you did not like those which in England we have chosen, your leaders might have exerted their abilities in contriving better. If it were necessary to exemplify the consequences of such an executive government as yours in the management of great affairs, I should refer you to the late reports of M. de Montmorin to the National Assembly and all the other proceedings relative to the differences between Great Britain and Spain. It would be treating your understanding with disrespect to point them out to you. I hear that the persons who are called ministers have signified an intention of resigning their places. I am rather astonished that they have not resigned long since. For the universe, I would not have stood in the situation in which they have been for this last twelve month. They wished well, I take it for granted, to the revolution. Let this fact be as it may, they could not, placed as they were upon an eminence, though an eminence of humiliation, but be the first to see collectively, and to feel each in his own department, the evils which have been produced by that revolution. In every step which they took, or forbore to take, they must have felt the degraded situation of their country, and their utter incapacity of serving it. They are in a species of subordinate servitude in which no men before them were ever seen, without confidence from their sovereign, on whom they were forced, or from the assembly who forced them upon him. All the noble functions of their office are executed by committees of the assembly, without any regard whatsoever to their personal or their official authority. They are to execute without power, they are to be responsible without discretion, they are to deliberate without choice. In their puzzled situation, under two sovereigns, over neither of whom they have any influence, they must act in such a manner as, in effect whatever they may intend, sometimes to betray the one, sometimes the other, and always to betray themselves. Such has been their situation. Such must be the situation of those who succeed them. I have much respect and many good wishes for Monsieur Necker. I am obliged to him for attentions. I thought, when his enemies had driven him from Versailles, that his exile was a subject of most serious congratulations. Sed multe urbes et publica vota vicerunt. He is now sitting on the ruins of the finances and of the monarchy of France. A great deal more might be observed on the strange constitution of the executory part of the new government, but fatigue must give bounds to the discussion of subjects, which in themselves have hardly any limits. End of section 18. Section 19. As little genius and talent am I able to perceive in the plan of the judicature formed by the National Assembly. 
according to their invariable course the framers of your constitution have begun with the utter abolition of the parliaments these venerable bodies like the rest of the old government stood in need of reform even though there should be no change made in the monarchy they required several more alterations to adapt them to the system of a free constitution but they had particulars in their constitution and those not a few which deserved approbation from the wise they possessed one fundamental excellence they were independent the most doubtful circumstance attendant on their office that of its being vendible contributed however to this independency of character they held for life indeed they may be said to have held by inheritance appointed by the monarch they were considered as nearly out of his power the most determined exertions of that authority against them only showed their radical independence they composed permanent bodies politic constituted to resist arbitrary innovation and from that corporate constitution and from most of their forms they were well calculated to afford both certainty and stability to the laws they had been a safe asylum to secure these laws in all the revolutions of humor and opinion they had saved that sacred deposit of the country during the reigns of arbitrary princes and the struggles of arbitrary factions they kept alive the memory and record of the constitution they were the great security to private property which might be said when personal liberty had no existence to be in fact as well guarded in france as in any other country whatever is supreme in a state ought to have as much as possible its judicial authority so constituted as not only to depend upon it but in some sort to balance it it ought to give a security to its justice against its power it ought to make its judicature as it were something exterior to the state those parliaments had furnished not the best certainly but some considerable corrective to the excesses and vices of the monarchy such an independent judicature was ten times more necessary when a democracy became the absolute power of the country in that constitution elective temporary local judges such as you have contrived exercising their dependent functions in a narrow society must be the worst of all tribunals in them it will be vain to look for any appearance of justice towards strangers towards the obnoxious rich towards the minority of routed parties towards all those who in the election have supported unsuccessful candidates it will be impossible to keep the new tribunals clear of the worst spirit of faction all contrivances by ballot we know experimentally to be vain and childish to prevent a discovery of inclinations where they may the best answer the purposes of concealment they answer to produce suspicion and this is a still more mischievous cause of partiality if the parliaments had been preserved instead of being dissolved at so ruinous a change to the nation they might have served in this new commonwealth perhaps not precisely the same i do not mean an exact parallel but near the same purposes as the court and senate of Areopagus did in athens that is as one of the balances and correctives to the evils of a light and unjust democracy every one knows that this tribunal was the great stay of that state every one knows with what care it was upheld and with what a religious awe it was consecrated the parliaments were not wholly free from faction i admit but this evil was exterior and accidental and not so much the vice of their constitution itself as it must be in your new contrivance of sexennial elective judicatories several english commend the abolition of the old tribunals as supposing that they determined everything by bribery and corruption but they have stood the test of monarchic and republican scrutiny the court was well disposed to prove corruption on those bodies when they were dissolved in seventeen seventy one those who have again dissolved them would have done the same if they could but both inquisitions having failed i conclude that gross pecuniary corruption must have been rather rare amongst them it would have been prudent along with the parliaments to preserve their ancient power of registering and of remonstrating at least upon all the decrees of the national assembly as they did upon those which passed in the time of the monarchy it would be a means of squaring the occasional decrees of a democracy to some principles of general jurisprudence the vice of the ancient democracies and one cause of their ruin was that they ruled as you do by occasional decrees cephismata 
this practice soon broke in upon the tenor and consistency of the laws it abated the respect of the people towards them and totally destroyed them in the end your vesting the power of remonstrance which in the time of the monarchy existed in the parliament of paris in your principal executive officer whom in spite of common sense you persevere in calling king is the height of absurdity you ought never to suffer remonstrance from him who is to execute this is to understand neither counsel nor execution neither authority nor obedience the person whom you call king ought not to have this power or he ought to have more your present arrangement is strictly judicial instead of imitating your monarchy and seating your judges on a bench of independence your object is to reduce them to the most blind obedience as you have changed all things you have invented new principles of order you first appoint judges who i suppose are to determine according to law and then you let them know that at some time or other you intend to give them some law by which they are to determine any studies which they have made if any they have made are to be useless to them but to supply these studies they are to be sworn to obey all the rules orders and instructions which from time to time they are to receive from the national assembly these if they submit to they leave no ground of law to the subject they become complete and most dangerous instruments in the hands of the governing power which in the midst of a cause or on the prospect of it may wholly change the rule of decision if these orders of the national assembly come to be contrary to the will of the people who locally choose those judges such confusion must happen as is terrible to think of for the judges owe their place to the local authority and the commands they are sworn to obey come from those who have no share in their appointment in the meantime they have the example of the court of chatelet to encourage and guide them in the exercise of their functions that court is to try criminals sent to it by the national assembly or brought before it by other courses of delation they sit under a guard to save their own lives they know not by what law they judge nor under what authority they act nor by what tenure they hold it is thought that they are sometimes obliged to condemn at peril of their lives this is not perhaps certain nor can it be ascertained but when they acquit we know they have seen the persons whom they discharge with perfect impunity to the actors hanged at the door of their court the assembly indeed promises that they will form a body of law which shall be short simple clear and so forth that is by their short laws they will leave much to the discretion of the judge whilst they have exploded the authority of all the learning which could make judicial discretion a thing perilous at best deserving the appellation of a sound discretion it is curious to observe that the administrative bodies are carefully exempted from the jurisdiction of these new tribunals that is those persons are exempted from the power of the laws who ought to be the most entirely submitted to them those who execute public pecuniary trusts ought of all men to be the most strictly held to their duty one would have thought that it must have been among your earliest cares if you did not mean that those administrative bodies should be real sovereign independent states to form an awful tribunal like your late parliaments or like our king's bench where all corporate officers might obtain protection in the legal exercise of their functions and would find coercion if they trespassed against their legal duty but the cause of the exemption is plain these administrative bodies are the great instruments of the present leaders in their progress through democracy to oligarchy they must therefore be put above the law it will be said that the legal tribunals which you have made are unfit to coerce them they are undoubtedly they are unfit for any rational purpose it will be said too that the administrative bodies will be accountable to the general assembly this i fear is talking without much consideration of the nature of that assembly or of these corporations however to be subject to the pleasure of that assembly is not to be subject to law either for protection or for constraint this establishment of judges as yet wants something to its completion it is to be crowned by a new tribunal this is to be a grand state judicature and it is to judge of crimes committed against the nation that is against the power of the assembly 
it seems as if they had something in their view of the nature of the high court of justice erected in england during the time of the great usurpation as they have not yet finished this part of the scheme it is impossible to form a direct judgment upon it however if great care is not taken to form it in a spirit very different from that which has guided them in their proceedings relative to state offences this tribunal subservient to their inquisition the committee of research will extinguish the last sparks of liberty in france and settle the most dreadful and arbitrary tyranny ever known in any nation if they wish to give to this tribunal any appearance of liberty and justice they must not evoke from or send to it the causes relative to their own members at their pleasure they must also remove the seat of that tribunal out of the republic of paris footnote for further elucidations upon the subject of all these judicatures and of the committee of research see m de calonne's work End of footnote. has more wisdom been displayed in the constitution of your army than what is discoverable in your plan of judicature the able arrangement of this part is the more difficult and requires the greater skill and attention not only as a great concern in itself but as it is the third cementing principle in the new body of republics which you call the french nation truly it is not easy to divine what that army may become at last you have voted a very large one and on good appointments at least fully equal to your apparent means of payment but what is the principle of its discipline or whom is it to obey you have got the wolf by the ears and i wish you joy of the happy position in which you have chosen to place yourselves and in which you are well circumstanced for a free deliberation relatively to that army or to anything else the minister and secretary of state for the war department is m de la tour de pin this gentleman like his colleagues in administration is a most zealous asserter of the revolution and a sanguine admirer of the new constitution which originated in that event his statement of facts relative to the military of france is important not only from his official and personal authority but because it displays very clearly the actual condition of the army in france and because it throws light on the principles upon which the assembly proceeds in the administration of this critical object it may enable us to form some judgment how far it may be expedient in this country to imitate the martial policy of france m de la tour du pin on the fourth of last june comes to give an account of the state of his department as it exists under the auspices of the national assembly no man knows it so well no man can express it better addressing himself to the national assembly he says his majesty has this day sent me to apprise you of the multiplied disorders of which every day he receives the most distressing intelligence the army le corps militaire threatens to fall into the most turbulent anarchy entire regiments have dared to violate at once the respect due to the laws to the king to the order established by your decrees and to the oaths which they have taken with the most awful solemnity compelled by my duty to give you information of these excesses my heart bleeds when i consider who they are that have committed them those against whom it is not in my power to withhold the most grievous complaints are a part of that very soldiery which to this day have been so full of honor and loyalty and with whom for fifty years i have lived the comrade and the friend what incomprehensible spirit of delirium and delusion has all at once led them astray whilst you are indefatigable in establishing uniformity in the empire and moulding the whole into one coherent and consistent body whilst the french are taught by you at once the respect which the laws owe to the rights of man and that which the citizens owe to the laws the administration of the army presents nothing but disturbance and confusion i see in more than one corps the bonds of discipline relaxed or broken the most unheard of pretensions avowed directly and without any disguise the ordinances without force the chiefs without authority the military chest and the colors carried off the authority of the king himself risum teniatis proudly defied the officers despised degraded threatened driven away and some of them prisoners in the midst of their corps dragging on a precarious life in the bosom of disgust and humiliation to fill up the measure of all these horrors 
the commandants of places have had their throats out under their eyes and almost in the arms of their own soldiers these evils are great but they are not the worst consequences which may be produced by such military insurrections sooner or later they may menace the nation itself the nature of things requires that the army should never act but as an instrument the moment that erecting itself into a deliberative body it shall act according to its own resolutions the government be it what it may will immediately degenerate into a military democracy a species of political monster which has always ended by devouring those who have produced it after all this who must not be alarmed at the irregular consultations and turbulent committees formed in some regiments by the common soldiers and non-commissioned officers without the knowledge or even in the contempt of the authority of their superiors although the presence and concurrence of those superiors could give no authority to such monstrous democratic assemblies commissaires it is not necessary to add much to this finished picture finished as far as its canvas admits but as i apprehend not taking in the whole of the nature and complexity of the disorders of this military democracy which the minister at war truly and wisely observes wherever it exists must be the true constitution of the state by whatever formal appellation it may pass for though he informs the assembly that the more considerable part of the army have not cast off their obedience but are still attached to their duty yet those travellers who have seen the corps whose conduct is the best rather observe in them the absence of mutiny than the existence of discipline i cannot help pausing here for a moment to reflect upon the expressions of surprise which this minister has let fall relative to the excesses he relates to him the departure of the troops from their ancient principles of loyalty and honor seems quite inconceivable surely those to whom he addresses himself know the causes of it but too well they know the doctrines which they have preached the decrees which they have passed the practices which they have countenanced the soldiers remember the sixth of october they recollect the french guards they have not forgot the taking of the king's castles in paris and at marseilles that the governors in both places were murdered with impunity is a fact that has not passed out of their minds they do not abandon the principles laid down so ostentatiously and laboriously of the equality of men they cannot shut their eyes to the degradation of the whole noblesse of france and the suppression of the very idea of a gentleman the total abolition of titles and distinctions is not lost upon them but m dupin is astonished at their disloyalty when the doctors of the assembly have taught them at the same time the respect due to laws it is easy to judge which of the two sorts of lessons men with arms in their hands are likely to learn as to the authority of the king we may collect from the minister himself if any argument on that head were not quite superfluous that it is not of more consideration with these troops than it is with everybody else the king says he has over and over again repeated his orders to put a stop to these excesses but in so terrible a crisis your the assemblies concurrence is become indispensably necessary to prevent the evils which menace the state you unite to the force of the legislative power that of opinion still more important to be sure the army can have no opinion of the power or authority of the king perhaps the soldier has by this time learned that the assembly itself does not enjoy a much greater degree of liberty than that royal figure it is now to be seen what has been proposed in this exigency one of the greatest that can happen in a state the minister requests the assembly to array itself in all its terrors and to call forth all its majesty he desires that the grave and severe principles announced by them may give vigor to the king's proclamation after this we should have looked for courts civil and martial breaking of some corps decimating of others and all the terrible means which necessity has employed in such cases to arrest the progress of the most terrible of all evils particularly one might expect that a serious inquiry would be made into the murder of commandants in the view of their soldiers not one word of all this or of anything like it after they had been told that the soldiery trampled upon the decrees of the assembly promulgated by the king 
the assembly passed new decrees and they authorized the king to make new proclamations after the secretary at war had stated that the regiments had paid no regard to oaths prêté avec la plus imposante solennité, they proposed what more oaths they renew decrees and proclamations as they experience their insufficiency and they multiply oaths in proportion as they weaken in the minds of men the sanctions of religion i hope that handy abridgments of the excellent sermons of voltaire d'alembert diderot and helvetius on the immortality of the soul on a particular superintending providence and on a future state of rewards and punishments are sent down to the soldiers along with their civic oaths of this i have no doubt as i understand that a certain description of reading makes no inconsiderable part of their military exercises and that they are full as well supplied with the ammunition of pamphlets as of cartridges to prevent the mischiefs arising from conspiracies irregular consultations seditious committees and monstrous democratic assemblies comitia comices of the soldiers and all the disorders arising from idleness luxury dissipation and insubordination i believe the most astonishing means have been used that ever occurred to men even in all the inventions of this prolific age it is no less than this the king has promulgated in circular letters to all the regiments his direct authority and encouragement that the several corps should join themselves with the clubs and confederations in the several municipalities and mix with them in their feasts and civic entertainments this jolly discipline it seems is to soften the ferocity of their minds to reconcile them to their bottle companions of other descriptions and to merge particular conspiracies in more general associations Footnote. Comme sa majesté a reconnu non un système d'association particulière, mais une réunion de volonté de tous les Français pour la liberté et la prospérité commune, ainsi pour le maintien de l'ordre public, il a pensé qu'il convenait que chaque régiment prît part à ses fêtes civiques pour multiplier les rapports et resserrer les liens d'union entre les citoyens et les troupes. Lest I should not be credited. I insert the words authorizing the troops to feast with the popular confederacies. End of footnote. That this remedy would be pleasing to the soldiers, as they are described by M. de la Tour du Pine, I can readily believe, and that, however mutinous otherwise, they will dutifully submit themselves to these royal proclamations. But I should question whether all this civic swearing, clubbing, and feasting would dispose them, more than at present they are disposed, to an obedience to their officers, or teach them better to submit to the austere rules of military discipline. It will make them admirable citizens after the French mode, but not quite so good soldiers after any mode. A doubt might well arise whether the conversations at these good tables would fit them a great deal the better for the character of mere instruments, which this veteran officer and statesman justly observes the nature of things always requires an army to be. Concerning the likelihood of this improvement in discipline by the free conversation of the soldiers with the municipal festive societies, which is thus officially encouraged by royal authority and sanction, we may judge by the state of the municipalities themselves, furnished to us by the war minister in this very speech. He conceives good hopes of the success of his endeavors towards restoring order for the present from the good disposition of certain regiments but he finds something cloudy with regard to the future. As to preventing the return of confusion, for this the administration, says he, cannot be answerable to you as long as they see the municipalities arrogate to themselves an authority over the troops which your institutions have reserved wholly to the monarch. You have fixed the limits of the military authority and the municipal authority. You have bounded the action which you have permitted to the latter over the former to the right of requisition but never did the letter or the spirit of your decrees authorize the commons in these municipalities to break the officers to try them to give orders to the soldiers to drive them from the posts committed to their guard to stop them in their marches ordered by the king or in a word to enslave the troops to the caprice of each of the cities or even market towns through which they are to pass such is the character and disposition of the municipal society which is to reclaim the soldiery to bring them back to the true principles of military subordination 
and to render them machines in the hands of the supreme power of the country such are the distempers of the french troops such is their cure as the army is so is the navy the municipalities supersede the orders of the assembly and the seamen in their turn supersede the orders of the municipalities from my heart i pity the condition of a respectable servant of the public like this war minister obliged in his old age to pledge the assembly in their civic cups and to enter with a hoary head into all the fantastic vagaries of these juvenile politicians such schemes are not like propositions coming from a man of fifty years wear and tear amongst mankind they seem rather such as ought to be expected from those grand compounders in politics who shorten the road to their degrees in the state and have a certain inward fanatical assurance and illumination upon all subjects upon the credit of which one of their doctors has thought fit with great applause and greater success to caution the assembly not to attend to old men or to any persons who value themselves upon their experience i suppose all the ministers of state must qualify and take this test wholly abjuring the errors and heresies of experience and observation every man has his own relish but i think if i could not attain to the wisdom i would at least preserve something of the stiff and peremptory dignity of age these gentlemen deal in regeneration but at any price i should hardly yield my rigid fibres to be regenerated by them nor begin in my grand climacteric to squall in their new accents or to stammer in my second cradle the elemental sounds of their barbarous metaphysics footnote this war minister has since quitted the school and resigned his office End of footnote. si isti mihi largiantur ut repuerascam et in eorum cuni suagiam valde recusem end of section nineteen section twenty the imbecility of any part of the puerile and pedantic system which they call a constitution cannot be laid open without discovering the utter insufficiency and mischief of every other part with which it comes in contact or that bears any the remotest relation to it you cannot propose a remedy for the incompetence of the crown without displaying the debility of the assembly you cannot deliberate on the confusion of the army of the state without disclosing the worst disorders of the armed municipalities the military lays open the civil and the civil betrays the military anarchy i wish everybody carefully to peruse the eloquent speech such it is of m de la tour dupin he attributes the salvation of the municipalities to the good behavior of some of the troops these troops are to preserve the well-disposed part of the municipalities which is confessed to be the weakest from the pillage of the worst disposed which is the strongest but the municipalities affect a sovereignty and will command those troops which are necessary for their protection indeed they must command them or court them the municipalities by the necessity of their situation and by the republican powers they have obtained must with relation to the military be the masters or the servants or the confederates or each successively or they must make a jumble of all together according to circumstances what government is there to coerce the army but the municipality or the municipality but the army to preserve concord where authority is extinguished at the hazard of all consequences the assembly attempts to cure the distempers by the distempers themselves and they hope to preserve themselves from a purely military democracy by giving it a debauched interest in the municipal if the soldiers once come to mix for any time in the municipal clubs cabals and confederacies an elective attraction will draw them to the lowest and most desperate part with them will be their habits affections and sympathies the military conspiracies which are to be remedied by civic confederacies the rebellious municipalities which are to be rendered obedient by furnishing them with the means of seducing the very armies of the state that are to keep them in order all of these chimeras of a monstrous and portentous policy must aggravate the confusion from which they have arisen there must be blood the want of common judgment manifested in the construction of all their descriptions of forces and in all their kinds of civil and judicial authorities will make it flow 
Disorders may be quieted in one time and in one part, they will break out in others, because the evil is radical and intrinsic. All these schemes of mixing mutinous soldiers with seditious citizens must weaken still more and more the military connection of soldiers with their officers, as well as add military and mutinous audacity to turbulent artificers and peasants. To secure a real army, the officer should be first and last in the eye of the soldier, first and last in his attention, observance, and esteem. Officers, it seems, there are to be, whose chief qualifications must be temper and patience. They are to manage their troops by electioneering arts. They must bear themselves as candidates, not as commanders. But as by such means power may be occasionally in their hands, the authority by which they are to be nominated becomes of high importance. What you may do finally does not appear, nor is it of much moment, whilst the strange and contradictory relation between your army and all the parts of your republic as well as the puzzled relation of those parts to each other and to the whole, remain as they are. You seem to have given the provisional nomination of the officers, in the first instance, to the king, with a reserve of approbation by the National Assembly. Men who have an interest to pursue are extremely sagacious in discovering the true seat of power. They must soon perceive that those who can negative indefinitely, in reality, appoint. The officers must, therefore, look to their intrigues in the assembly as the sole certain road to promotion. Still, however, by your new constitution, they must begin their solicitation at court. This double negotiation for military rank seems to me a contrivance as well adapted as if it were studied for no other end to promote faction in the assembly itself relative to this vast military patronage and then to poison the corps of officers with factions of a nature still more dangerous to the safety of government, upon any bottom on which it can be placed, and destructive in the end to the efficacy of the army itself. Those officers who lose the promotions intended for them by the crown must become of a faction opposite to that of the assembly which has rejected their claims, and must nourish discontents in the heart of the army against the ruling powers those officers on the other hand who by carrying their point through an interest in the assembly feel themselves to be at best only second in the good will of the crown though first in that of the assembly must slight an authority which would not advance and could not retard their promotion if to avoid these evils you will have no other rule for command or promotion than seniority you will have an army of formality at the same time it will become more independent and more of a military republic. Not they, but the king is the machine. A king is not to be deposed by halves. If he is not everything in the command of an army, he is nothing. What is the effect of a power placed nominally at the head of the army, who to that army is no object of gratitude or of fear? Such a cipher is not fit for the administration of an object of all things the most delicate the supreme command of military men. They must be constrained, and their inclinations lead them to what their necessities require, by a real, vigorous, effective, decided personal authority. The authority of the assembly itself suffers by passing through such a debilitating channel as they have chosen. The army will not long look to an assembly acting through the organ of false show and palpable imposition. They will not seriously yield obedience to a prisoner. They will either despise a pageant or they will pity a captive king. This relation of your army to the crown will, if I am not greatly mistaken, become a serious dilemma in your politics. It is besides to be considered whether an assembly like yours, even supposing that it was in possession of another sort of organ through which its orders were to pass, is fit for promoting the obedience and discipline of an army. It is known that armies have hitherto yielded a very precarious and uncertain obedience to any senate or popular authority, and they will least of all yield it to an assembly which is to have only a continuance of two years. The officers must totally lose the characteristic disposition of military men, if they see with perfect submission and due admiration the dominion of leaders especially when they find that they have a new court to pay to an endless succession of those pleaders whose military policy 
and the genius of whose command if they should have any must be as uncertain as their duration is transient in the weakness of one kind of authority and in the fluctuation of all the officers of an army will remain for some time mutinous and full of faction until some popular general who understands the art of conciliating the soldiery and who possesses the true spirit of command shall draw the eyes of all men upon himself armies will obey him on his personal account there is no other way of securing military obedience in this state of things but the moment in which that event shall happen the person who really commands the army is your master the master that is little of your king the master of your assembly the master of your whole republic how came the assembly by their present power over the army chiefly to be sure by debauching the soldiers from their officers they have begun by a most terrible operation they have touched the central point about which the particles that compose armies are at repose they have destroyed the principle of obedience in the great essential critical link between the officer and the soldier just where the chain of military subordination commences and on which the whole of that system depends the soldier is told he is a citizen and has the rights of man and citizen the right of a man he is told is to be his own governor and to be ruled only by those to whom he delegates that self-government it is very natural he should think that he ought most of all to have his choice where he is to yield the greatest degree of obedience he will therefore in all probability systematically do what he does at present occasionally that is he will exercise at least a negative in the choice of his officers at present the officers are known at best to be only permissive and on their good behavior in fact there have been many instances in which they have been cashiered by their corps here is a second negative on the choice of the king a negative as effectual at least as the other of the assembly the soldiers know already that it has been a question not ill received in the national assembly whether they ought not to have the direct choice of their officers or some proportion of them when such matters are in deliberation it is no extravagant supposition that they will incline to the opinion most favorable to their pretensions they will not bear to be deemed the army of an imprisoned king whilst another army in the same country with whom too they are to feast and confederate is to be considered as the free army of a free constitution they will cast their eyes on the other and more permanent army i mean the municipal that corps they well know does actually elect its own officers they may not be able to discern the grounds of distinction on which they are not to elect a marquis de lafayette or what is his new name of their own if this election of a commander-in-chief be a part of the rights of men why not of theirs they see elective justices of peace elective judges elective curates elective bishops elective municipalities and elective commanders of the parisian army why should they alone be excluded are the brave troops of france the only men in that nation who are not the fit judges of military merit and of the qualifications necessary for a commander-in-chief are they paid by the state and do they therefore lose the rights of men they are a part of that nation themselves and contribute to that pay and is not the king is not the national assembly and are not all who elect the national assembly likewise paid instead of seeing all these forfeit their rights by their receiving a salary they perceive that in all these cases a salary is given for the exercise of those rights all your resolutions all your proceedings all your debates all the works of your doctors in religion and politics have industriously been put into their hands and you expect that they will apply to their own case just as much of your doctrines and examples as suits your pleasure everything depends upon the army in such a government as yours for you have industriously destroyed all the opinions and prejudices and as far as in you lay all the instincts which support government therefore the moment any difference arises between your national assembly and any part of the nation you must have recourse to force nothing else is left to you or rather you have left nothing else to yourselves you see by the report of your war minister that the distribution of the army is in a great measure made with a view of internal coercion 
you must rule by an army and you have infused into that army by which you rule as well as into the whole body of the nation principles which after a time must disable you in the use you resolve to make of it the king is to call out troops to act against his people when the world has been told and the assertion is still ringing in our ears that troops ought not to fire on citizens the colonies assert to themselves an independent constitution and a free trade they must be constrained by troops in what chapter of your code of the rights of men are they able to read that it is a part of the rights of men to have their commerce monopolized and restrained for the benefit of others as the colonists rise on you the negroes rise on them troops again massacre torture hanging these are your rights of men these are the fruits of metaphysic declarations wantonly made and shamefully retracted it was but the other day that the farmers of land in one of your provinces refused to pay some sorts of rents to the lord of the soil in consequence of this you decree that the country people shall pay all rents and dues except those which as grievances you have abolished and if they refuse then you order the king to march troops against them you lay down metaphysic propositions which infer universal consequences and then you attempt to limit logic by despotism the leaders of the present system tell them of their rights as men to take fortresses to murder guards to seize on kings without the least appearance of authority even from the assembly whilst as the sovereign legislative body that assembly was sitting in the name of the nation and yet these leaders presume to order out the troops which have acted in these very disorders to coerce those who shall judge on the principles and follow the examples which have been guaranteed by their own approbation the leaders teach the people to abhor and reject all feudality as the barbarism of tyranny and they tell them afterwards how much of that barbarous tyranny they are to bear with patience as they are prodigal of light with regard to grievances so the people find them sparing in the extreme with regard to redress they know that not only certain quit rents and personal duties which you have permitted them to redeem but have furnished no money for the redemption are as nothing to those burdens for which you have made no provision at all they know that almost the whole system of landed property in its origin is feudal that it is the distribution of the possessions of the original proprietors made by a barbarous conqueror to his barbarous instruments and that the most grievous effects of the conquest acts the land rents of every kind as without question they are the peasants in all probability are the descendants of these ancient proprietors romans or gauls but if they fail in any degree in the titles which they make on the principles of antiquaries and lawyers they retreat into the citadel of the rights of men there they find that men are equal and the earth the kind and equal mother of all ought not to be monopolized to foster the pride and luxury of any men who by nature are no better than themselves and who if they do not labor for their bread are worse they find that by the laws of nature the occupant and subduer of the soil is the true proprietor that there is no prescription against nature and that the agreements where any there are which have been made with the landlords during the time of slavery are only the effect of duress and force and that when the people re-entered into the rights of men those agreements were made as void as everything else which had been settled under the prevalence of the old feudal and aristocratic tyranny they will tell you that they see no difference between an idler with a hat and a national cockade and an idler in a cowl or in a rocher if you ground the title to rents on succession and prescription they tell you from the speech of monsieur camus published by the national assembly for their information that things ill begun cannot avail themselves of prescription that the title of those lords was vicious in its origin and that force is at least as bad as fraud as to the title by succession they will tell you that the succession of those who have cultivated the soil is the true pedigree of property and not rotten parchments and silly substitutions that the lords have enjoyed their usurpation too long and that if they allow to these lay monks any charitable pension they ought to be thankful to the bounty of the true proprietor who is so generous towards a false claimant to his goods 
when the peasants give you back that coin of sophistic reason on which you have set your image and superscription you cry it down as base money and tell them you will pay for the future with french guards and dragoons and hussars you hold up to chastise them the second-hand authority of a king who is only the instrument of destroying without any power of protecting either the people or his own person through him it seems you will make yourselves obeyed they answer you have taught us that there are no gentlemen and which of your principles teach us to bow to kings whom we have not elected we know without your teaching that lands were given for the support of feudal dignities feudal titles and feudal offices when you took down the cause as a grievance why should the more grievous effect remain as there are now no hereditary honors and no distinguished families why are we taxed to maintain what you tell us ought not to exist you have sent down our old aristocratic landlords in no other character and with no other title but that of exactors under your authority have you endeavored to make these your rent-gatherers respectable to us no you have sent them to us with their arms reversed their shields broken their impresses defaced and so displumed degraded and metamorphosed such unfeathered two-legged things that we no longer know them they are strangers to us they do not even go by the names of our ancient lords physically they may be the same men though we are not quite sure of that on your new philosophic doctrines of personal identity in all other respects they are totally changed we do not see why we have not as good a right to refuse them their rents as you have to abrogate all their honors titles and distinctions this we have never commissioned you to do and it is one instance among many indeed of your assumption of undelegated power we see the burghers of paris through their clubs their mobs and their national guards directing you at their pleasure and giving that as law to you which under your authority is transmitted as law to us through you these burghers dispose of the lives and fortunes of us all why should not you attend as much to the desires of the laborious husbandman with regard to our rent by which we are affected in the most serious manner as you do to the demands of these insolent burghers relative to distinctions and titles of honor by which neither they nor we are affected at all but we find you pay more regard to their fancies than to our necessities is it among the rights of man to pay tribute to his equals before this measure of yours we might have thought we were not perfectly equal we might have entertained some old habitual unmeaning prepossession in favor of those landlords but we cannot conceive with what other view than that of destroying all respect to them you could have made the law that degrades them you have forbidden us to treat them with any of the old formalities of respect and now you send troops to sabre and to bayonet us into a submission to fear and force which you did not suffer us to yield to the mild authority of opinion the ground of some of these arguments is horrid and ridiculous to all rational ears but to the politicians of metaphysics who have opened schools for sophistry and made establishments for anarchy it is solid and conclusive it is obvious that on a mere consideration of the right the leaders in the assembly would not in the least have scrupled to abrogate the rents along with the titles and family ensigns it would be only to follow up the principle of their reasonings and to complete the analogy of their conduct but they had newly possessed themselves of the great body of landed property by confiscation they had this commodity at market and the market would have been wholly destroyed if they were to permit the husbandmen to riot in the speculations with which they so freely intoxicated themselves the only security which property enjoys in any one of its descriptions is from the interests of their rapacity with regard to some other they have left nothing but their own arbitrary pleasure to determine what property is to be protected and what subverted neither have they left any principle by which any of their municipalities can be bound to obedience or even conscientiously obliged not to separate from the whole to become independent or to connect itself with some other state the people of lyon it seems have refused lightly to pay taxes why should they not what lawful authority is there left to exact them the king imposed some of them 
the old states methodized by orders settled the more ancient they may say to the assembly who are you that are not our kings nor the states we have elected nor sit on the principles on which we have elected you and who are we that when we see the gabelles which you have ordered to be paid wholly shaken off when we see the act of disobedience afterwards ratified by yourselves who are we that we are not to judge what taxes we ought or ought not to pay and are not to avail ourselves of the same powers the validity of which you have approved in others to this the answer is we will send troops the last reason of kings is always the first with your assembly this military aid may serve for a time whilst the impression of the increase of pay remains and the vanity of being umpires in all disputes is flattered but this weapon will snap short unfaithful to the hand that employs it the assembly keep a school where systematically and with unremitting perseverance they teach principles and form regulations destructive to all spirit of subordination civil and military and then they expect that they should hold in obedience an anarchic people by an anarchic army the municipal army which according to their new policy is to balance this national army if considered in itself only is of a constitution much more simple and in every respect less exceptionable it is a mere democratic body unconnected with the crown or the kingdom armed and trained and officered at the pleasure of the districts to which the corps severally belong and the personal service of the individuals who compose or the fine in lieu of personal service are directed by the same authority footnote i see by m necker's account that the national guards of paris have received over and above the money levied within their own city about one hundred forty five thousand pounds sterling out of the public treasure whether this be an actual payment for the nine months of their existence or an estimate of their yearly charge i do not clearly perceive it is of no great importance as certainly they may take whatever they please End of footnote. nothing is more uniform if however considered in any relation to the crown to the national assembly to the public tribunals or to the other army or considered in a view to any coherence or connection between its parts it seems a monster and can hardly fail to terminate its perplexed movements in some great national calamity it is a worse preservative of a general constitution than the cystasis of crete or the confederation of poland or any other ill-devised corrective which has yet been imagined in the necessities produced by an ill-constructed system of government End of section 20. Section 21. Having concluded my few remarks on the constitution of the supreme power, the executive, the judicature, the military, and on the reciprocal relation of all these establishments, I shall say something of the ability showed by your legislators with regard to the revenue. In their proceedings relative to this object, if possible, still fewer traces appear of political judgment or financial resource when the states met it seemed to be the great object to improve the system of revenue to enlarge its collection to cleanse it of oppression and vexation and to establish it on the most solid footing great were the expectations entertained on that head throughout europe it was by this grand arrangement that france was to stand or fall and this became in my opinion very properly the test by which the skill and patriotism of those who ruled in that assembly would be tried the revenue of the state is the state in effect all depends upon it whether for support or for reformation the dignity of every occupation wholly depends upon the quantity and the kind of virtue that may be exerted in it as all great qualities of the mind which operate in public and are not merely suffering and passive require force for their display i had almost said for their unequivocal existence the revenue which is the spring of all power becomes in its administration the sphere of every active virtue public virtue being of a nature magnificent and splendid instituted for great things and conversant about great concerns requires abundant scope and room and cannot spread and grow under confinement and in circumstances straitened narrow and sordid 
through the revenue alone the body politic can act in its true genius and character and therefore it will display just as much of its collective virtue and as much of that virtue which may characterize those who move it and are as it were its life and guiding principle as it is possessed of a just revenue for from hence not only magnanimity and liberality and beneficence and fortitude and providence and the tutelary protection of all good arts derive their food and the growth of their organs but continence and self-denial and labor and vigilance and frugality and whatever else there is in which the mind shows itself above the appetite are nowhere more in their proper element than in the provision and distribution of the public wealth it is therefore not without reason that the science of speculative and practical finance which must take to its aid so many auxiliary branches of knowledge stands high in the estimation not only of the ordinary sort but of the wisest and best men and as this science has grown with the progress of its object the prosperity and improvement of nations has generally increased with the increase of their revenues and they will both continue to grow and flourish as long as the balance between what is left to strengthen the efforts of individuals and what is collected for the common efforts of the state bear to each other a due reciprocal proportion and are kept in a close correspondence and communication and perhaps it may be owing to the greatness of revenues and to the urgency of state necessities that old abuses in the constitution of finances are discovered and their true nature and rational theory comes to be more perfectly understood insomuch that a smaller revenue might have been more distressing in one period than a far greater is found to be in another the proportionate wealth even remaining the same in this state of things the french assembly found something in their revenues to preserve to secure and wisely to administer as well as to abrogate and alter though their proud assumption might justify the severest tests yet in trying their abilities on their financial proceedings i would only consider what is the plain obvious duty of a common finance minister and try them upon that and not upon models of ideal perfection the objects of a financier are then to secure an ample revenue to impose it with judgment and equality to employ it economically and when necessity obliges him to make use of credit to secure its foundations in that instance and forever by the clearness and candor of his proceedings the exactness of his calculations and the solidity of his funds on these heads we may take a short and distinct view of the merits and abilities of those in the national assembly who have taken to themselves the management of this arduous concern far from any increase of revenue in their hands i find by a report of m vanier from the committee of finances of the second of august last that the amount of the national revenue as compared with its produce before the revolution was diminished by the sum of two hundred millions or eight millions sterling of the annual income considerably more than one-third of the whole if this be the result of great ability never surely was ability displayed in a more distinguished manner or with so powerful an effect no common folly no vulgar incapacity no ordinary official negligence even no official crime no corruption no peculation hardly any direct hostility which we have seen in the modern world could in so short a time have made so complete an overthrow of the finances and with them of the strength of a great kingdom quedo quivestrum republicum tantum amicistis tam quito the sophisters and declaimers as soon as the assembly met began with decrying the ancient constitution of the revenue in many of its most essential branches such as the public monopoly of salt they charged it as truly as unwisely with being ill-contrived oppressive and partial this representation they were not satisfied to make use of in speeches preliminary to some plan of reform they declared it in a solemn resolution or public sentence as it were judicially passed upon it and this they dispersed throughout the nation at the time they passed the decree with the same gravity they ordered the same absurd oppressive and partial tax to be paid until they could find a revenue to replace it the consequence was inevitable 
the provinces which had always been exempted from this salt monopoly some of whom were charged with other contributions perhaps equivalent were totally disinclined to bear any part of the burden which by an equal distribution was to redeem the others as to the assembly occupied as it was with the declaration and violation of the rights of men and with their arrangements for general confusion it had neither leisure nor capacity to contrive nor authority to enforce any plan of any kind relative to the replacing the tax or equalizing it or compensating the provinces or for conducting their minds to any scheme of accommodation with the other districts which were to be relieved the people of the salt provinces impatient under taxes damned by the authority which had directed their payment very soon found their patience exhausted they thought themselves as skilful in demolishing as the assembly could be they relieved themselves by throwing off the whole burden animated by this example each district or part of a district judging of its own grievance by its own feeling and of its remedy by its own opinion did as it pleased with other taxes we are next to see how they have conducted themselves in contriving equal impositions proportioned to the means of the citizens and the least likely to lean heavy on the active capital employed in the generation of that private wealth from whence the public fortune must be derived by suffering the several districts and several of the individuals in each district to judge of what part of the old revenue they might withhold instead of better principles of equality a new inequality was introduced of the most oppressive kind payments were regulated by dispositions the parts of the kingdoms which were the most submissive the most orderly or the most affectionate to the commonwealth bore the whole burden of the state nothing turns out to be so oppressive and unjust as a feeble government to fill up all the deficiencies in the old impositions and the new deficiencies of every kind which were to be expected what remained to a state without authority the national assembly called for a voluntary benevolence for a fourth part of the income of all the citizens to be estimated on the honor of those who were to pay they obtained something more than could be rationally calculated but what was far indeed from answerable to their real necessities and much less to their fond expectations rational people could have hoped for little from this their tax in the disguise of a benevolence tax weak ineffective and unequal a tax by which luxury avarice and selfishness were screened and the load thrown upon productive capital upon integrity generosity and public spirit a tax of regulation upon virtue at length the mask is thrown off and they are now trying means with little success of exacting their benevolence by force this benevolence the rickety offspring of weakness was to be supported by another resource the twin brother of the same prolific imbecility the patriotic donations were to make good the failure of the patriotic contribution john doe was to become security for richard roe by this scheme they took things of much price from the giver comparatively of small value to the receiver they ruined several trades they pillaged the crown of its ornaments the churches of their plate and the people of their personal decorations the invention of those juvenile pretenders to liberty was in reality nothing more than a servile imitation of one of the poorest resources of doting despotism they took an old huge full-bottomed periwig out of the wardrobe of the antiquated frippery of louis the fourteenth to cover the premature baldness of the national assembly they produced this old-fashioned formal folly though it had been so abundantly exposed in the memoirs of the duc de saint simon if to reasonable men it had wanted any arguments to display its mischief and insufficiency a device of the same kind was tried in my memory by louis the fifteenth but it answered at no time however the necessities of ruinous wars were some excuse for desperate projects the deliberations of calamity are rarely wise but here was a season for disposition and providence it was in a time of profound peace then enjoyed for five years and promising a much longer continuance that they had recourse to this desperate trifling they were sure to lose more reputation by sporting in their serious situation with these toys and playthings of finance 
which have filled half their journals than could possibly be compensated by the poor temporary supply which they afforded it seemed as if those who adopted such projects were wholly ignorant of their circumstances or wholly unequal to their necessities whatever virtue may be in these devices it is obvious that neither the patriotic gifts nor the patriotic contribution can ever be resorted to again the resources of public folly are soon exhausted the whole indeed of their scheme of revenue is to make by any artifice an appearance of a full reservoir for the hour whilst at the same time they cut off the springs and living fountains of perennial supply the account not long since furnished by m necker was meant without question to be favorable he gives a flattering view of the means of getting through the year but he expresses as it is natural he should some apprehension for that which is to succeed on this last prognostic instead of entering into the grounds of this apprehension in order by a proper foresight to prevent the prognosticated evil m necker receives a sort of friendly reprimand from the president of the assembly as to their other schemes of taxation it is impossible to say anything of them with certainty because they have not yet had their operation but nobody is so sanguine as to imagine they will fill up any perceptible part of the wide gaping breach which their incapacity has made in their revenues at present the state of their treasury sinks every day more and more in cash and swells more and more in fictitious representation when so little within or without is now found but paper the representative not of opulence but of want the creature not of credit but of power they imagine that our flourishing state in england is owing to that bank paper and not the bank paper to the flourishing condition of our commerce to the solidity of our credit and to the total exclusion of all idea of power from any part of the transaction they forget that in england not one shilling of paper money of any description is received but of choice that the whole has had its origin in cash actually deposited and that it is convertible at pleasure in an instant and without the smallest loss into cash again our paper is of value in commerce because in law it is of none it is powerful on change because in westminster hall it is impotent in payment of a debt of twenty shillings a creditor may refuse all the paper of the bank of england nor is there amongst us a single public security of any quality or nature whatsoever that is enforced by authority in fact it might be easily shown that our paper wealth instead of lessening the real coin has a tendency to increase it instead of being a substitute for money it only facilitates its entry its exit and its circulation that it is the symbol of prosperity and not the badge of distress never was a scarcity of cash and an exuberance of paper a subject of complaint in this nation well but a lessening of prodigal expenses and the economy which has been introduced by the virtuous and sapient assembly make amends for the losses sustained in the receipt of revenue in this at least they have fulfilled the duty of a financier have those who say so looked at the expenses of the national assembly itself of the municipalities of the city of paris of the increased pay of the two armies of the new police of the new judicatures have they even carefully compared the present pension list with the former these politicians have been cruel not economical comparing the expenses of the former prodigal government and its relation to the then revenues with the expenses of this new system as opposed to the state of its new treasury i believe the present will be found beyond all comparison more chargeable footnote the reader will observe that i have but lightly touched my plan demanded nothing more on the condition of the french finances as connected with the demands upon them if i had intended to do otherwise the materials in my hands for such a task are not altogether perfect on this subject i refer the reader to m de calonne's work and the tremendous display that he has made of the havoc and devastation in the public estate and in all the affairs of france caused by the presumptuous good intentions of ignorance and incapacity such effects those causes will always produce 
looking over that account with a pretty strict eye and with perhaps too much rigor deducting everything which may be placed to the account of a financier out of place who might be supposed by his enemies desirous of making the most of his cause i believe it will be found that a more salutary lesson of caution against the daring spirit of innovators than what has been supplied at the expense of france never was at any time furnished to mankind End of footnote. it remains only to consider the proofs of financial ability furnished by the present french managers when they are to raise supplies on credit here i am a little at a stand for credit properly speaking they have none the credit of the ancient government was not indeed the best but they could always on some terms command money not only at home but from most of the countries of europe where a surplus capital was accumulated and the credit of that government was improving daily the establishment of a system of liberty would of course be supposed to give it new strength and so it would actually have done if a system of liberty had been established what offers has their government of pretended liberty had from holland from hamburg from switzerland from genoa from england for a dealing in their paper why should these nations of commerce and economy enter into any pecuniary dealings with a people who attempt to reverse the very nature of things amongst whom they see the debtor prescribing at the point of the bayonet the medium of his solvency to the creditor discharging one of his engagements with another turning his very penury into his resource and paying his interest with his rags their fanatical confidence in the omnipotence of church plunder has induced these philosophers to overlook all care of the public estate just as the dream of the philosopher's stone induces dupes under the more plausible delusion of the hermetic art to neglect all rational means of improving their fortunes with these philosophic financiers this universal medicine made of church mummy is to cure all the evils of the state these gentlemen perhaps do not believe a great deal in the miracles of piety but it cannot be questioned that they have an undoubting faith in the prodigies of sacrilege is there a debt which presses them issue assignats are compensations to be made or a maintenance decreed to those whom they have robbed of their freehold in their office or expelled from their profession assignats is a fleet to be fitted out assignats if sixteen millions sterling of these assignats forced on the people leave the wants of the state as urgent as ever issue says one thirty millions sterling of assignats says another issue fourscore millions more of assignats the only difference among their financial factions is on the greater or the lesser quantity of assignats to be imposed on the public sufferance they are all professors of assignats even those whose natural good sense and knowledge of commerce not obliterated by philosophy furnish decisive arguments against this delusion conclude their arguments by proposing the emission of assignats i suppose they must talk of assignats as no other language would be understood all experience of their inefficacy does not in the least discourage them are the old assignats depreciated at market what is the remedy issue new assignats ma i si malati a opiniatria non vult segarire quid illi facere assignare postea assignare en suita assignare the word is a trifle altered the latin of your present doctors may be better than that of your old comedy their wisdom and the variety of their resources are the same they have not more notes in their song than the cuckoo though far from the softness of that harbinger of summer and plenty their voice is as harsh and as ominous as that of the raven who but the most desperate adventurers in philosophy and finance could at all have thought of destroying the settled revenue of the state the sole security for the public credit in the hope of rebuilding it with the materials of confiscated property if however an excessive zeal for the state should have led a pious and venerable prelate by anticipation a father of the church to pillage his own order footnote la bruyere of bossuet and a footnote and for the good of the church and people to take upon himself the place of grand financier of confiscation and comptroller general of sacrilege he and his coadjutors were in my opinion bound to show 
by their subsequent conduct that they knew something of the office they assumed when they had resolved to appropriate to the fisc a certain portion of the landed property of their conquered country it was their business to render their bank a real fund of credit as far as such a bank was capable of becoming so to establish a current circulating credit upon any land bank under any circumstances whatsoever has hitherto proved difficult at the very least the attempt has commonly ended in bankruptcy but when the assembly were led through a contempt of moral to a defiance of economical principles it might at least have been expected that nothing would be omitted on their part to lessen this difficulty to prevent any aggravation of this bankruptcy it might be expected that to render your land bank tolerable every means would be adopted that could display openness and candor in the statement of the security everything which could aid the recovery of the demand to take things in their most favorable point of view your condition was that of a man of a large landed estate which he wished to dispose of for the discharge of a debt and the supply of certain services not being able instantly to sell you wished to mortgage what would a man of fair intentions and a commonly clear understanding do in such circumstances ought he not first to ascertain the gross value of the estate the charges of its management and disposition the encumbrances perpetual and temporary of all kinds that affect it then striking a net surplus to calculate the just value of the security when that surplus the only security to the creditor had been clearly ascertained and properly vested in the hands of trustees then he would indicate the parcels to be sold and the time and conditions of sale after this he would admit the public creditor if he chose it to subscribe his stock into this new fund or he might receive proposals for an assignat from those who would advance money to purchase this species of security this would be to proceed like men of business methodically and rationally and on the only principles of public and private credit that have an existence the dealer would then know exactly what he purchased and the only doubt which could hang upon his mind would be the dread of the resumption of the spoil which one day might be made perhaps with an addition of punishment from the sacrilegious gripe of those execrable wretches who could become purchasers at the auction of their innocent fellow-citizens an open and exact statement of the clear value of the property and of the time the circumstances and the place of sale were all necessary to efface as much as possible the stigma that has hitherto been branded on every kind of land bank it became necessary on another principle that is on account of a pledge of faith previously given on that subject that their future fidelity in a slippery concern might be established by their adherence to their first engagement when they had finally determined on a state resource from church booty they came on the fourteenth of april seventeen ninety to a solemn resolution on the subject and pledged themselves to their country that in the statement of the public charges for each year there should be brought to account a sum sufficient for defraying the expenses of the roman catholic religion the support of the ministers at the altars the relief of the poor the pensions to the ecclesiastics secular as well as regular of the one and of the other sects in order that the estates and goods which are at the disposal of the nation may be disengaged of all charges and employed by the representatives or the legislative body to the great and most pressing exigencies of the state they further engaged on the same day that the sum necessary for the year seventeen ninety one should be forthwith determined in this resolution they admitted their duty to show distinctly the expense of the above objects which by other resolutions they had before engaged should be first in the order of provision they admit that they ought to show the estate clear and disengaged of all charges and that they should show it immediately have they done this immediately or at any time have they ever furnished a rent roll of the immovable estate or given in an inventory of the movable effects which they confiscate to their assignats in what manner they can fulfil their engagements of holding out to public service an estate disengaged of all charges without authenticating the value of the estate or the quantum of the charges i leave it to their english admirers to explain instantly upon this assurance 
and previously to any one step towards making it good they issue on the credit of so handsome a declaration sixteen millions sterling of their paper this was manly who after this masterly stroke can doubt of their abilities in finance but then before any other emission of these financial indulgences they took care at least to make good their original promise if such estimate either of the value of the estate or the amount of the encumbrances has been made it has escaped me i never heard of it at length they have spoken out and they have made a full discovery of their abominable fraud in holding out the church lands as a security for any debts or any service whatsoever they rob only to enable them to cheat but in a very short time they defeat the ends both of the robbery and the fraud by making out accounts for other purposes which blow up their whole apparatus of force and of deception i am obliged to m de calonne for his reference to the document which proves this extraordinary fact it had by some means escaped me indeed it was not necessary to make out my assertion as to the breach of faith on the declaration of the fourteenth of april seventeen ninety by a report of their committee it now appears that the charge of keeping up the reduced ecclesiastical establishments and other expenses attendant on religion and maintaining the religious of both sexes retained or pensioned and the other concomitant expenses of the same nature which they have brought upon themselves by this convulsion in property exceeds the income of the estates acquired by it in the enormous sum of two millions sterling annually besides a debt of seven millions and upwards these are the calculating powers of imposture this is the finance of philosophy this is the result of all the delusions held out to engage a miserable people in rebellion murder and sacrilege and to make them prompt and zealous instruments in the ruin of their country never did a state in any case enrich itself by the confiscations of the citizens this new experiment has succeeded like all the rest every honest mind every true lover of liberty and humanity must rejoice to find that injustice is not always good policy nor rapine the high road to riches i subjoin with pleasure in a note the able and spirited observations of m de calonne on this subject footnote ce n'est point à l'assemblée entière que je m'adresse ici je ne parle qu'à ceux qui l'égarent en lui cachant sous des gazes séduisantes le but où il l'entraîne c'est à eux que je dis votre objet vous n'en disconviendrez pas c'est d'ôter tout espoir au clergé et de consommer sa ruine c'est là en ne vous soupçonnant d'aucune combinaison de cupidité d'aucun regard sur le jeu des effets publics c'est là ce qu'on doit croire que vous avez en vue dans la terrible opération que vous proposez c'est ce qui doit en être le fruit mais le peuple que vous y intéressez quel avantage peut-il y trouver en vous servant sans cesse de lui, que faites-vous pour lui Rien, absolument rien. Et au contraire, vous faites ce qui ne conduit qu'à l'accabler de nouvelles charges. Vous avez rejeté, à son préjudice, une offre de quatre cents millions dont l'acceptation pouvait devenir un moyen de soulagement en sa faveur. Et à cette ressource, aussi profitable que légitime, vous avez substitué une injustice ruineuse qui, de votre propre aveu, charge le trésor public et par conséquent le peuple d'un surcroît de dépenses annuelles de cinquante millions au moins et d'un remboursement de cent cinquante millions malheureux peuple voilà ce que vous vaut en dernier résultat l'expropriation de l'église et la dureté des décrets taxateurs du traitement des ministres d'une religion bienfaisante et désormais ils seront à votre charge leur charité soulageait les pauvres et vous allez être imposé pour subvenir à leur entretien. De l'État de la France. End of footnote. End of section 21. Section 22. In order to persuade the world of the bottomless resource of ecclesiastical confiscation, the Assembly have proceeded to other confiscations of estates in offices which could not be done with any common color without being compensated out of this grand confiscation of landed property they have thrown upon this fund which was to show a surplus disengaged of all charges a new charge 
namely the compensation to the whole body of the disbanded judicature and of all suppressed offices and estates a charge which i cannot ascertain but which unquestionably amounts to many french millions another of the new charges is an annuity of four hundred and eighty thousand pounds sterling to be paid if they choose to keep faith by daily payments for the interest of the first assignats have they ever given themselves the trouble to state fairly the expense of the management of the church lands in the hands of the municipalities to whose care skill and diligence and that of their legion of unknown under agents they have chosen to commit the charge of the forfeited estates and the consequence of which had been so ably pointed out by the bishop of nancy but it is unnecessary to dwell on these obvious heads of encumbrance have they made out any clear state of the grand encumbrance of all i mean the whole of the general and municipal establishments of all sorts and compared it with the regular income by revenue every deficiency in these becomes a charge on the confiscated estate before the creditor can plant his cabbages on an acre of church property there is no other prop than this confiscation to keep the whole state from tumbling to the ground in this situation they have purposely covered all that they ought industriously to have cleared with a thick fog and then blindfold themselves like bulls that shut their eyes when they push they drive by the point of the bayonets their slaves blindfolded indeed no worse than their lords to take their fictions for currencies and to swallow down paper pills by thirty-four millions sterling at a dose then they proudly lay in their claim to a future credit on failure of all their past engagements and at a time when if in such a matter anything can be clear it is clear that the surplus estates will never answer even the first of their mortgages i mean that of the four hundred millions or sixteen millions sterling of assignats in all this procedure i can discern neither the solid sense of plain dealing nor the subtle dexterity of ingenious fraud the objections within the assembly to pulling up the floodgates for this inundation of fraud are unanswered but they are thoroughly refuted by an hundred thousand financiers in the street these are the numbers by which the metaphysic arithmeticians compute these are the grand calculations on which a philosophical public credit is founded in france they cannot raise supplies but they can raise mobs let them rejoice in the applauses of the club at dundee for their wisdom and patriotism in having thus applied the plunder of the citizens to the service of the state i hear of no address upon this subject from the directors of the bank of england though their approbation would be of a little more weight in the scale of credit than that of the club at dundee but to do justice to the club i believe the gentlemen who compose it to be wiser than they appear that they will be less liberal of their money than of their addresses and that they would not give a dog's ear of their most rumpled and ragged scotch paper for twenty of your fairest assignats early in this year the assembly issued paper to the amount of sixteen millions sterling what must have been the state into which the assembly has brought your affairs that the relief afforded by so vast a supply has been hardly perceptible this paper also felt an almost immediate depreciation of five per cent which in a little time came to about seven the effect of these assignats on the receipt of the revenue is remarkable m necker found that the collectors of the revenue who received in coin paid the treasury in assignats the collectors made seven per cent by thus receiving in money and accounting in depreciated paper it was not very difficult to foresee that this must be inevitable it was however not the less embarrassing m necker was obliged i believe for a considerable part in the market of london to buy gold and silver for the mint which amounted to about twelve thousand pounds above the value of the commodity gained that minister was of opinion that whatever their secret nutritive virtue might be the state could not live upon assignats alone that some real silver was necessary particularly for the satisfaction of those who having iron in their hands were not likely to distinguish themselves for patience when they should perceive that whilst an increase of pay was held out to them in real money it was again to be fraudulently drawn back by depreciated paper 
the minister in this very natural distress applied to the assembly that they should order the collectors to pay in specie what in specie they had received it could not escape him that if the treasury paid three per cent for the use of a currency which should be returned seven per cent worse than the minister issued it such a dealing could not very greatly tend to enrich the public the assembly took no notice of his recommendation they were in this dilemma if they continued to receive the assignats cash must become an alien to their treasury if the treasury should refuse those paper amulets or should discountenance them in any degree they must destroy the credit of their sole resource they seem then to have made their option and to have given some sort of credit to their paper by taking it themselves at the same time in their speeches they made a sort of swaggering declaration something i rather think above legislative competence that is that there is no difference in value between metallic money and their assignats this was a good stout proof article of faith pronounced under an anathema by the venerable fathers of this philosophic synod credat who will certainly not judaeus appella a noble indignation rises in the minds of your popular leaders on hearing the magic lantern in their show of finance compared to the fraudulent exhibitions of mr law they cannot bear to hear the sands of his mississippi compared with the rock of the church on which they build their system pray let them suppress this glorious spirit until they show to the world what piece of solid ground there is for their assignats which they have not preoccupied by other charges they do injustice to that great mother fraud to compare it with their degenerate imitation it is not true that law built solely on a speculation concerning the mississippi he added the east india trade he added the african trade he added the farms of all the farmed revenue of france all these together unquestionably could not support the structure which the public enthusiasm not he chose to build upon these bases but these were however in comparison generous delusions they supposed and they aimed at an increase of the commerce of france they opened to it the whole range of the two hemispheres they did not think of feeding france from its own substance a grand imagination found in this flight of commerce something to captivate it was wherewithal to dazzle the eye of an eagle it was not made to entice the smell of a mole nuzzling and burying himself in his mother earth as yours is men were not then quite shrunk from their natural dimensions by a degrading and sordid philosophy and fitted for low and vulgar deceptions above all remember that in imposing on the imagination the then managers of the system made a compliment to the freedom of men in their fraud there was no mixture of force this was reserved to our time to quench the little glimmerings of reason which might break in upon the solid darkness of this enlightened age on recollection i have said nothing of a scheme of finance which may be urged in favor of the abilities of these gentlemen and which has been introduced with great pomp though not yet finally adopted in the national assembly it comes with something solid in aid of the credit of the paper circulation and much has been said of its utility and its elegance i mean the project for coining into money the bells of the suppressed churches this is their alchemy there are some follies which baffle argument which go beyond ridicule and which excite no feeling in us but disgust and therefore i say no more upon it it is as little worth remarking any further upon all their drawing and redrawing on their circulation for putting off the evil day on the play between the treasury and the caisse d'escompte and on those old exploded contrivances of mercantile fraud now exalted into policy of state the revenue will not be trifled with the prattling about the rights of men will not be accepted in payment of a biscuit or a pound of gunpowder here then the metaphysicians descend from their airy speculations and faithfully follow examples what examples the examples of bankrupts but defeated baffled disgraced when their breath their strength their inventions their fancies desert them their confidence still maintains its ground in the manifest failure of their abilities they take credit for their benevolence 
when the revenue disappears in their hands they have the presumption in some of their late proceedings to value themselves on the relief given to the people they did not relieve the people if they entertained such intentions why did they order the obnoxious taxes to be paid the people relieved themselves in spite of the assembly but waiving all discussions on the parties who may claim the merit of this fallacious relief has there been in effect any relief to the people in any form m bailly one of the grand agents of paper circulation lets you into the nature of this relief his speech to the national assembly contained a high and labored panegyric on the inhabitants of paris for the constancy and unbroken resolution with which they have borne their distress and misery a fine picture of public felicity what great courage and unconquerable firmness of mind to endure benefits and sustain redress one would think from the speech of this learned lord mayor that the parisians for this twelve month past had been suffering the straits of some dreadful blockade that henry the fourth had been stopping up the avenues of their supply and sully thundering with his ordnance at the gates of paris when in reality they are besieged by no other enemies than their own madness and folly their own credulity and perverseness but m bailly will sooner thaw the eternal ice of his atlantic regions than restore the central heat to paris whilst it remains smitten with the cold dry petrific mace of a false and unfeeling philosophy some time after this speech that is on the thirteenth of last august the same magistrate giving an account of his government at the bar of the same assembly expresses himself as follows in the month of july seventeen eighty nine the period of everlasting commemoration the finances of the city of paris were yet in good order the expenditure was counterbalanced by the receipt and she had at that time a million forty thousand pounds sterling in bank the expenses which she has been constrained to incur subsequent to the revolution amount to two million five hundred thousand livres from these expenses and the great falling off in the product of the free gifts not only a momentary but a total want of money has taken place this is the paris upon whose nourishment in the course of the last year such immense sums drawn from the vitals of all france have been expended as long as paris stands in the place of ancient rome so long she will be maintained by the subject provinces it is an evil inevitably attendant on the dominion of sovereign democratic republics as it happened in rome it may survive that republican domination which gave rise to it in that case despotism itself must submit to the vices of popularity rome under her emperors united the evils of both systems and this unnatural combination was one great cause of her ruin to tell the people that they are relieved by the dilapidation of their public estate is a cruel and insolent imposition statesmen before they valued themselves on the relief given to the people by the destruction of their revenue ought first to have carefully attended to the solution of this problem whether it be more advantageous to the people to pay considerably and to gain in proportion or to gain little or nothing and to be disburdened of all contribution my mind is made up to decide in favor of the first proposition experience is with me and i believe the best opinions also to keep a balance between the power of acquisition on the part of the subject and the demands he is to answer on the part of the state is the fundamental part of the skill of a true politician the means of acquisition are prior in time and in arrangement good order is the foundation of all good things to be enabled to acquire the people without being servile must be tractable and obedient the magistrate must have his reverence the laws their authority the body of the people must not find the principles of natural subordination by art rooted out of their minds they must respect that property of which they cannot partake they must labor to obtain what by labor can be obtained and when they find as they commonly do the success disproportioned to the endeavor they must be taught their consolation in the final proportions of eternal justice 
of this consolation whoever deprives them deadens their industry and strikes at the root of all acquisition as of all conservation he that does this is the cruel oppressor the merciless enemy of the poor and wretched at the same time that by his wicked speculations he exposes the fruits of successful industry and the accumulations of fortune to the plunder of the negligent the disappointed and the unprosperous too many of the financiers by profession are apt to see nothing in revenue but banks and circulations and annuities on lives and tontines and perpetual rents and all the small wares of the shop in a settled order of the state these things are not to be slighted nor is the skill in them to be held of trivial estimation they are good but then only good when they assume the effects of that settled order and are built upon it but when men think that these beggarly contrivances may supply a resource for the evils which result from breaking up the foundations of public order and from causing or suffering the principles of property to be subverted they will in the ruin of their country leave a melancholy and lasting monument of the effects of preposterous politics and presumptuous short-sighted narrow-minded wisdom the effects of the incapacity shown by the popular leaders in all the great members of the commonwealth are to be covered with the all-atoning name of liberty in some people i see great liberty indeed in many if not the most an oppressive degrading servitude but what is liberty without wisdom and without virtue it is the greatest of all possible evils for it is folly vice and madness without tuition or restraint those who know what virtuous liberty is cannot bear to see it disgraced by incapable heads on account of their having high-sounding words in their mouths grand swelling sentiments of liberty i am sure i do not despise they warm the heart they enlarge and liberalize our minds they animate our courage in a time of conflict old as i am i read the fine raptures of lucan and cornea with pleasure neither do i wholly condemn the little arts and devices of popularity they facilitate the carrying of many points of moment they keep the people together they refresh the mind in its exertions and they diffuse occasional gaiety over the severe brow of moral freedom every politician ought to sacrifice to the graces and to join compliance with reason but in such an undertaking as that in france all these subsidiary sentiments and artifices are of little avail to make a government requires no great prudence settle the seat of power teach obedience and the work is done to give freedom is still more easy it is not necessary to guide it only requires to let go the rein but to form a free government that is to temper together these opposite elements of liberty and restraint in one consistent work requires much thought deep reflection a sagacious powerful and combining mind this i do not find in those who take the lead in the national assembly perhaps they are not so miserably deficient as they appear i rather believe it it would put them below the common level of human understanding but when the leaders choose to make themselves bidders at an auction of popularity their talents in the construction of the state will be of no service they will become flatterers instead of legislators the instruments not the guides of the people if any of them should happen to propose a scheme of liberty soberly limited and defined with proper qualifications he will be immediately outbid by his competitors who will produce something more splendidly popular suspicions will be raised of his fidelity to his cause moderation will be stigmatized as the virtue of cowards and compromise as the prudence of traitors until in hopes of preserving the credit which may enable him to temper and moderate on some occasions the popular leader is obliged to become active in propagating doctrines and establishing powers that will afterwards defeat any sober purpose at which he ultimately might have aimed but am i so unreasonable as to see nothing at all that deserves commendation in the indefatigable labors of this assembly i do not deny that among an infinite number of acts of violence and folly some good may have been done they who destroy everything 
certainly will remove some grievance. They who make everything new have a chance that they may establish something beneficial. To give them credit for what they have done in virtue of the authority they have usurped, or to excuse them in the crimes by which that authority has been acquired, it must appear that the same things could not have been accomplished without producing such a revolution. Most assuredly they might, because almost every one of the regulations made by them, which is not very equivocal, was either in the session of the king, voluntarily made at the meeting of the states, or in the concurrent instructions to the orders. Some usages have been abolished on just grounds, but they were such that, if they had stood as they were to all eternity, they would little detract from the happiness and prosperity of any state. The improvements of the National Assembly are superficial, their errors fundamental. Whatever they are, I wish my countrymen rather to recommend to our neighbors the example of the British Constitution than to take models from them for the improvement of our own. In the former they have got an invaluable treasure. They are not, I think, without some causes of apprehension and complaint, but these they do not owe to their constitution, but to their own conduct. I think our happy situation, owing to our constitution, but owing to the whole of it, and not to any part singly, owing in a great measure to what we have left standing in our several reviews and reformations, as well as to what we have altered or superadded. Our people will find employment enough for a truly patriotic, free, and independent spirit in guarding what they possess from violation. I would not exclude alteration neither, but even when I changed, it should be to preserve. I should be led to my remedy by a great grievance. In what I did, I should follow the example of our ancestors. I would make the reparation as nearly as possible in the style of the building. A politic caution, a guarded circumspection, a moral rather than a complexional timidity, were among the ruling principles of our forefathers in their most decided conduct. Not being illuminated with the light of which the gentlemen of France tell us they have got so abundant a share, they acted under a strong impression of the ignorance and fallibility of mankind. He that had made them thus fallible, rewarded them for having in their conduct attended to their nature. Let us imitate their caution, if we wish to deserve their fortune, or to retain their bequests. Let us add, if we please, but let us preserve what they have left, and standing on the firm ground of the British Constitution, let us be satisfied to admire, rather than attempt to follow, in their desperate flights, the aeronauts of France. I have told you candidly my sentiments. I think they are not likely to alter yours. I do not know that they ought. You are young. You cannot guide, but must follow, the fortune of your country. But hereafter they may be of some use to you, in some future form which your commonwealth may take. In the present it can hardly remain, but before its final settlement it may be obliged to pass, as one of our poets says, through great varieties of untried being, and in all its transmigrations, to be purified by fire and blood. I have little to recommend my opinions, but long observation and much impartiality. They come from one who has been no tool of power, no flatterer of greatness, and who in his last acts does not wish to belie the tenor of his life. They come from one almost the whole of whose public exertion has been a struggle for the liberty of others, from one in whose breast no anger durable or vehement has ever been kindled but by what he considered as tyranny, and who snatches from his share in the endeavors which are used by good men to discredit opulent oppression the hours he has employed on your affairs, and who in so doing persuades himself he has not departed from his usual office. They come from one who desires honors, distinctions, and emoluments but little, and who expects them not at all, who has no contempt for fame and no fear of obloquy, who shuns contention, though he will hazard an opinion, from one who wishes to preserve consistency, but who would preserve consistency by varying his means to secure the unity of his end. And, when the equipoise of the vessel in which he sails 
may be endangered by overloading it upon one side is desirous of carrying the small weight of his reasons to that which may preserve its equipoise end of section twenty two and end of reflections on the revolution in france by edmund burke